much, Eva. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm Jack Nod, Dean of NYU Steinhardt, and I am so pleased to welcome you all to today's session on Steinhardt's social impact, which will focus on arts and health at NYU, an exciting new Steinhardt-led initiative that brings together researchers and students from across the university to advance the relationship between education, research, practice, and policy in the arts and health. As many of you know, NYU Steinhardt was founded in 1890, and today we are the only school in the country devoted to a holistic understanding of people and human development across the lifespan, including the arts and culture, as well as mental and physical health. Our mission is to improve the education, health, and well being of people and communities here in New York and around the world. And we understand that creativity is at the heart of innovation and that innovation comes from collaboration across disciplines. To that end, we aspire to interconnect the arts and humanities with the social, behavioral and biological sciences through statistical and scientific analysis, human narratives, visual works of art and musical compositions and performance, we work together to improve people's lives and impact the policies and practices that drive change. Because we recognize that solutions to problems don't come from a single source, but from the creativity that emerges when researchers, scholars, musicians, and artists work together. At NYU Steinhardt, our programs in art, music, and drama therapy teach students how to integrate the healing arts into their practices. Research tells us that the arts therapies show great promise in reducing isolation and can help people to recover their creativity, imagine a better future, put ideas into action, and after injury or illness, feel alive again. Our alumni practitioners are reaching into local and global settings to bring the healing arts to those who have been neglected. They are working in communities where people need comforting and healing. They are creating programs that help people interpret, understand, and advocate for social change. And they help people experience relief, as well as all the beauty, joy, and complexity that life has to offer. In fact, one of our graduates is working with Chinese seniors in Queens to create memory objects, which are three-dimensional objects that tell life stories. Another living in Valparaiso, Chile, has created self-care music videos to help frontline hospital workers deal with the fatigue and stress of caring for COVID-19 patients. And the idea behind the Arts and Health at NYU initiative is to broaden the reach of these interventions, to create the data and empirical proof that art can be a powerful tool in physical and mental health care, and that it can be used to enhance the well being of children, families, and communities. And this collaboration has the potential to alter the healthcare landscape. And I look forward to sharing that vision with you today. So now it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Nisha, Nisha Sajnani, uh, Associate Professor and the Director of the Program in Drama Therapy and founding co-director of the Arts and Health at NYU Initiative. She will introduce the amazing Steinhardt faculty involved in today's presentation, Nisha. Thank you so much, Dean Knott, and thank you so much for the invitation to join you here today. I'm so excited to share with you uh, this time and time with my colleagues, who I'll introduce in a moment in the context of this new initiative that we're calling the Arts and Health at NYU. The Arts and Health at NYU is, as Jack said, a Steinhardt-based initiative that arose from a call from the World Health Organization to acknowledge and act on the evidence that we have for where the arts are making a measurable impact in both health promotion and treatment of specific physical, psychological, and social challenges that we face today. The initiative is based at Steinhardt because we have so many 
excellent examples of interdisciplinary research and practice with labs such as the Music and Audio Research Lab, the Verbatim Performance Lab, the Arts and Humanities Initiative, the Creative Arts Therapies Consortium, and the list goes on. However, it is a university-wide initiative that is co-led by colleagues from across NYU schools. And it, it's now my great pleasure to introduce colleagues who will share examples of how the arts contribute to healthy societies, support the training of health professionals, and treat specific conditions. And I'll ask you all to make note of your questions and your comments, and we'll return to them at the end of these four brief presentations. We're going to begin with Dr. Nicole R. Fleetwood, who is a recently named MacArthur Fellow and the inaugural James Weldon Johnson Professor of Media, Culture, and Communication. She is the author and curator of Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. And I pass it over to you, Nicole. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I wanna make sure I, I, people can hear me. Nisha, are you able to hear me? Yes. Great, okay. Um, and so thank you so much to my colleague, Nisha Sajnani for organizing it. And thanks to Ding Knott for the invitation to participate on this panel. Um, I want to I want to talk to you briefly about a project that I've been working on for over a decade as it connects with um, this larger initiative at Steinhardt around arts and health. Um, the project is called Marking Time Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. And it's um, a multi platform project that includes a book an exhibition and ongoing public programming where I co-create and collaborate with system impacted people. These are formerly and currently incarcerated artists, their allies, their loved ones, um, attorneys and nonprofit organizers. Um, the exhibition um, debuted at MoMA PS1 here in New York City in fall of last year and it closed there in, in April, 2021. In September, I had the incredible fortune um, in part, thanks to the support of Steinhardt and a grant from the Art for Justice Fund to travel the exhibition to Birmingham, Alabama. And Birmingham is a place of high significance for um, issues around human rights, uh, civil rights, ongoing social justice issues, um, and especially in this current moment, the state and condition of prisons. Um, Pris Alabama has the highest uh, suicide rate and murder rate in prisons. Most of the prisons are on former slave plantations and the treatment of currently incarcerated people in Alabama is very much linked to the history of slavery and the history of subjugation of black people. Um, as I have said repeatedly when I've talked about this project, a healthy society is a just society. And through marking time um, and through focusing on art made by incarcerated people, um, we use it as a platform to talk about a whole range of issues that are related to the criminalization and imprisonment of the most marginalized populations and how imprisonment diminished the life outcomes, the life possibilities of people who are held captive. A really urgent example of that is what's happening currently in New York City on Rikers Island, where over 14 people have died in the last year alone. Um, policing, prisons, gentrification, anti-Black violence, anti-immigrant sentiments, anti-gender non-conforming violence are all related issues. And, and they're all related to who ends up in prison and whose life outcomes are diminished through criminalization and imprisonment. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through some slides just to give you some examples of the artwork that, um, that you'll see in the Marking Time Project. Uh, what, right now, what you're looking at is an installation, two installations. One, the orange hoodies are a collaboration between an artist, Susan Lee Chun, and young girls who were in juvenile detention centers in Florida thinking about the criminalization of young uh, bodies, especially young bodies of color, Black, black and Latinx children and teens. Um, on the, the walls um, facing us are portraits by Mark Lotney, who's currently in prison 
in Pennsylvania where he survived COVID and the prison where he's incarcerated has been uh, several hotspots. And the way that uh, the prison at men, at men, excuse me, administration has done, dealt with the crisis is by putting people in solitary confinement. So they're dealing with a health crisis by creating more health crises, which is solitary confinement leads to all kinds of diminished life outcomes, including um, mental health issues um, and, and sensory um, it, it disorientation, as well as uh, physical disabilities, for example, mobility issues once people are released from long-term solitary confinement. Over the course of seven years, Mark Lotney has documented the toll of mass incarceration by doing portraits of incarcerated people. Next, next slide, thank you. Um, in the main gallery, this is so. This is uh, currently uh, the exhibition that's on view in Alabama at the Abram Engel Institute for Visual Arts, which is on the campus of the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And this is the main gallery room. And in this room, you see work by several formerly incarcerated artists who talk about the use of art making in prison as a, a strategy of survival, as a way of resisting the isolation, the alienation and the stigmatization of prison. So incarcerated artists will form really incredible, robust art communities inside prison, often through structured and unstructured activities. So informal collectives that, that occur among incarcerated people, as well as formal classes brought in by organizations like the Alabama Prison Arts and Education Project or the William James Association. Next slide, please. This is another view from um, the main gallery where you see a very large mural is 15 foot by 40 foot created by Jesse Crimes, formerly incarcerated artist, who over three years created these, um, uh, used prison bed sheets. This is actually made up of 39 prison bed sheets. And he would make one portion and send it out of prison. Um, and he was not able to see the work in, in its completion until he was released from prison over three years later. But he talks about the importance of working on this as a way of kind of uh, future planning, of not giving in to the desperation and, and isolation that prisons engender. Across from that or next to that, you see a work works by Ronnie Goodman who focused on portrait making during his time in prison. And portrait making was really a way of um, showing value and reverence for other incarcerated people who have been stigmatized and labeled basically a bad subject. So it was a way of really showing connection, love and care for his peers. Next. Many um, currently and formerly incarcerated artists will make art that connects criminalization and imprisonment to larger social structures and in forms of injustice like systemic anti-Black violence. You see that in the work of, of um, Russell Craig who created this really exquisite portrait of George Floyd, it's about eight feet tall. And next to that, you see a portion of a work by Jared Owens where he's connecting the long history of slavery and black subjugation to the current, current issues around mass incarceration. Next. So I'm gonna just wrap up by showing you a few more um, intimate works. Um, one by Tamika Cole, who's currently, her work is currently on view in Birmingham. Tamika survived 26 years in prison in Alabama where she experienced all kinds of uh, abuses, partly for being a black queer woman um, in uh, a maximum security prison um, and where the prison staff really tried to discipline her body and her look because of her, because she's gender nonconforming. Um, and she turned to art making as a strategy of survival. She talked about, for example, in this work, Locked in a Dark Calm, through making the collage that she was actually creating her own space of survival. Next. Here's a work by Dean Gillespie. Dean was in prison for 20 years. Um, he was a person who was wrongfully convicted. And the way he actually survived being, you know, uh, accusing and, uh, and, and imprisoned for something he didn't do and also 
um, a way of continuing to have hope and future planning was to make these elaborate miniatures. These miniatures would take anywhere from three to six months to make. And he said he used that to manage his sentencing, to manage prison time. He turned it into these elaborate art projects that would involve other imprisoned people who would help collect materials for him in the service of art making. So for example, in this dinette, he used foil from cigarette wrappers. The, it's held together by sewing pin needles that another imprisoned person brought out for him. The curtain is used tea bags, so he would innovate with all the objects around him um, in the service of his art making. Next. And so this, I, I'm gonna end with this final image by George Anthony Morton, who was imprisoned from the age of 19 to 29, basically for crimes of survival. Um, he grew up in a very poor, impoverished community um, in, in Missouri and, um, you know, suffered from intergenerational poverty, but also systemic racism, um, decriminalization of, of substance, substance use um, and, and other issues that we can dis discuss in, in Q&A. But he spent the 10 years in prison studying portrait making. And he said he turned the, the, those 10 years and in basically into a, an, an art school where he was self-teaching himself. Um, and he became so accomplished with his portrait making that once he was released from prison, he won a scholarship to the Florence Academy where this work here, Mars, um, was selected as the best portrait of the year in 2016. So I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nicole. I'll invite everyone to keep track of your comments and your questions. I'm sure there are already many to share. And it is my great pleasure now to introduce you to Dr. Mary Grace Barbarian, who's clinical faculty in the Graduate Art Therapy Program and director of the NYU Art Therapy in Schools Program. And she's joined by Dr. Alberto Puca, who is a Movement Disorders Fellowship trained neurologist and an adjunct professor of neurology at NYU School of Medicine. Welcome, Mary Grace and Alberto. A bright hello to you all on this cloudy New York City day. I'm delighted to be here. NYU has held a prominent role in the art therapy profession. Next. Edith Kramer, the grandmother of the profession, began our graduate training program in the 1970s, making us one of the most established programs in the country. Next. But what is art therapy? And to further explain, art therapy is a mental health profession. We rely on the therapeutic components of art making processes and its products for rehabilitation and psychological growth. Next. What many don't realize is that we are the only creatures on the planet to be creating art. And as evolved creatures, we rely on complex memory recall, spatial planning, and motor functioning that are all activated in the art making process. Next. But today we're talking about Parkinson's disease, one of the many social programs that we're leading. And there are very well known symptoms that inhibit optimal functioning uh, slow movements, balance issues, tremors, rigidity. Next. But there are also a host of visual, ocular, and perceptual def deficiencies that are less known. And in this creation that we're showcasing here, a participant imagines themselves wearing a John Lennon-inspired t-shirt as she imagines Parkinson's disease cured. Next. Truthfully, most traditional treatments look at signs and symptoms, working more from a deficit model. Next. But as our therapists, we support the idea of a strengths-based perspective to build participants stronger rather than focus on weaknesses. Next. So our therapy focuses on vitality since every time we create, we birth something new. And this is an example of a client who created himself as Zeus, balancing the world up above. We're focusing on what's strong and vital. Next. With great determination, we know that art making can, can lead to greater autonomy. And I want to show this clip where we can get a glimpse of that determination. Despite the extensive tremors, this participant continues to make art. Okay. 
Next. People with PD came to our campus to make art with our alumni and current grad students. They were kind of uh, ecstatic to be with our NYU college students in the Barney building. Next. But when COVID restricted our, our physical gathering, we pivoted to a telehealth platform. We taught people later in life how to use Zoom. We sent them art supplies. And amazingly, we connected virtually. Next. So what were the outcomes? Sensational neurological findings will be shared by my colleague, Dr. Kuka. But I'm going to share some of the findings from an art therapy perspective. We adapted and developed a specific assessment for people with Parkinson's disease, asking them to draw a house, a tree, and a person. And so in this pre-intervention example, we see the three elements really quite fragmented. The line pressure is light. But after 10 weeks, we'll see a more integrated composition. Next. The figure is now active on the path, walking their dog. Elements are securely grounded. We see much more investment in the work. Next. In the very last evaluation period, we repeated the assessment. And this work by that same participant shows vitality in the buildings. The buildings are bustling with energy and, and life. There you can see the evidence of social relationships and truly a much more fully envisioned scene. Next. And just to see that progression here, I think it's quite remarkable. Here's yet another example. We see a participant struggling to make it to their tree home that's sitting precariously on that tree's limb. So we see some difficulty, thanks. Now in this image, we see how this participant learned to make use of their tremors in their art making to create their own aesthetic. He puts himself drawing a new sapling into the environment with potential hope for some renewal. Next. And lastly, we're seeing a very robust figure who has built this bright tree home and he travels out into the bright world with conviction, fully embodied and ready to take on the world. I'm now going to pass our discussion on for the neurological findings by Dr. Kuka. It's an honor to really lead this work and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Nisha. Buongiorno. Greetings from Italy, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you the preliminary findings from the Explore RPD study. Parkinson's disease is traditionally described in terms of motor symptoms such as slowness, stiffness, tremor, and walking problems. However, Parkinson's disease can manifest itself with a broad array of non-motor features, including visual spatial problems. Now, the term visual spatial dysfunction refers to the specific impairment in the cognitive use of visual information. Normally, visual spatial skills allow us to perceive the environment around ourselves and to generate reliable coordinates guiding our movements in space. As a result of a faulty visual spatial function, patients can experience difficulties in estimating distances between objects, for example, or negotiating obstacles while walking in crowded environments. Now, our interactions with the creative process of art making imply the repeated goal-directed use of several visual spatial functions, such as shape recognition, motion perception, contrast coding, and figure-to-background segregation, which is our ability to recognize and identify specific visual stimuli when embedded into complex sensory patterns. If we think about it, artists have been successfully exploiting visual spatial skills for centuries in order to elicit specific aesthetic feelings or to achieve their conceptual goals. And this is truly the main scientific rationale beyond the Explore RPD study. Can the process of making art be used to rehabilitate faulty visual spatial functions in Parkinson's patients? And if this is true, uh, can these also translate into broader clinical improvements? So following uh, an art therapy intervention, which was developed by the amazing team of the art therapy graduate program at Steinart, 
we observed significant improvements in patients' visual constructional abilities and figure to background segregation as assessed by the Ray Complex figure test and the NAVM test, respectively. As you can see, as far as the Ray Complex figure test is concerned, which is in the top left corner of the screen, patients with Parkinson's disease show significantly poorer scores as compared with age-matched controls. But following our art therapy intervention, these functions significantly improve and become virtually indistinguishable from healthy controls. The same normalization effect is observed in figure two background segregation as assessed by the NAVM test. In the NAVM test, subjects are presented with a series of stimuli consisting in letters of different size and subjects are instructed to press a yes key anytime they see a letter, regardless to its size, or press a no key when that specific letter is not showed. So in order to provide an accurate answer, patients have to operate what is called discounting global preference, which is the natural proclivity of our visual system to prioritize large stimuli over smaller ones. As you can see following our art therapy intervention, the performance of Parkinson's patients significantly improves in that the number of errors on the NAVM test significantly drops down and becomes again virtually indistinguishable from what is observed in age-matched controls. We also recorded the way our patients moved their eyes while performing the Benton visual recognition test in which subjects are asked to find the right match for each test stimulus by choosing among four possible options. You can see that the overall length of eye movements that are needed to provide an accurate answer is significantly longer in patients with Parkinson's disease as compared to age-matched controls. But you can also see that following our therapy, the saccad path length significantly decrements denoting the onset of more efficient visual exploration strategies. Finally, we observed significant increases in levels of functional connectivity by means of resting state functional MRI occurring as a result of our art therapy intervention in brain regions specifically concerned with the processing of upcoming visual information. And this supports the hypothesis that in our study, the main source for the observed clinical improvements could be found in improved perception. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alberto and Mary Grace. Mary Grace, is there anything else you'd like to say? No, I look forward to collaborating with my, my team. Thank you. Thank you so much. Then it is my great pleasure here to introduce to you Lisa Sasson, uh, Associate Dean for Global Affairs and the Experiential Learning and Clinical Faculty in the Department of Nutrition and Food Studies. Joe Salvatore, who's Clinical Professor of Educational Theatre and the Director of the Verbatim Performance Lab and the Patient Actor Ensemble. And Dr. Alison Rangel, who's Academic Fieldwork Coordinator and in the Department of Occupational Therapy. Over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Nisha. Um, my name is Lisa Sasson, and I am just delighted to be here today and so proud to be a part of this wonderful program. So welcome to, to everyone. Um, COVID pandemic caused widespread disruption to traditional methods of professional training. COVID restricted in-person fieldwork and internship experiences in many of our programs, such as OT, occupational therapy, physical therapy, nutrition, communicative science disorders, and applied psych. The, cl the clinical placements are crucial for students to educate, learn how to educate and counsel future patients. I knew we had to find a way to ensure that our future health practitioners had this critical experience. But one of the other things that COVID forced us to do is to become more creative, to think outside the box. And that's when I had this aha moment. 
I thought about medical and nursing schools. They use something known as the standardized patient model where they, where standardized patients are actors and they create realistic standardized medical scenarios to, for the doctors to practice their clinical and counseling skills. And that's when I thought about Steinhardt. We have a wonderful program with Joel Salvatore, my colleague, where in the uh, education theater where students are trained to be actors. So I contacted Joe and I thought, let's see if we could have this collaboration. And I am so proud that this was very, very successful. And my colleagues, Alison Rangel and Joe will share their experiences. But I would like to end with this quote from one of my former students who participated in this uh, project. And she said that this experience of working with the student actors helped her to adapt to answering difficult questions in the moment, to develop her interviewing skills and counseling strategies and to become more comfortable with counseling patients. So I'd like to now pass this on to Professor Joe Salvatore. Joe? Sorry, I was muted. You think after all these ah. years, after all this time, I would know how to do that. But uh, Lisa, thank you very much. And um, thanks everyone for being here today. It's really great to be amongst colleagues who are thinking about how we can really uh, use the various disciplines that we come from to leverage uh, a better uh, society and world um, using, using our skill sets. Um, so when Lisa contacted me about this project, um, we were, of course, everyone was pivoting in, in March, April, May of 2020. And, um, but it seemed like a, a really great opportunity to uh, collaborate uh, across disciplines, which is something that you're hearing through these presentations that is fundamental to, to, to the Steinhardt School. And so um, what, what popped for me about it when Lisa made the invitation was that it was an opportunity to expand theater students' understandings of the capacities of theater and performance, right? So often we think about theater as, as you know, people on stage, people off stage, the commercialism of theater, um, Broadway, and this was an opportunity for us to really think about how performance can be um, deployed in ways that are that are not about uh, commercial theater or, or production necessarily. And again, the opportunity to be able to collaborate with the health disciplines um, was super exciting to me. And you're gonna, uh, Allison Rangel and I have been able to continue this collaboration over four semesters and uh, we've learned a lot together and you'll hear from her uh, in just a minute or so. Um, we've also been able to integrate this work into courses um, that we teach here at NYU in the educational theater program. And it provides, the patient actor ensemble provides students with opportunities to gain field work experience that they will be able to carry out into the world um, once they leave uh, NYU. Um, and one of the areas that we concentrate on in educational theater is something called applied theater or community engaged theater. And um, this is theater that happens in non-traditional spaces uh, with communities, often to explore a problem or a crisis um, and to generate um, ideas to solve those problems. In this case, uh, we're working with uh, a, a population of pre-professionals through the occupational therapy program now, where we're providing um, acting scenarios, uh, actors who engage in these acting scenarios, and then the occupational therapy pre-professional students are learning through those experiences in a telehealth environment before they go into um, the field. Um, one of the things that's been useful is that this has helped us teach actors to have agency. When they receive a scenario that they might be uh, have questions about, we encourage them to ask uh, for clarification. And so that's something that sometimes actors are not trained to have. In this case, we're training them to have agency. Um, and I also want to end with a quotation here that is from a student that participated in this. Um, frequently, um, actors can be a little self-absorbed, right? It's about the actor. And in this case, this particular student said, I found that it ended up working the other way around. Rather than how it can work for me, I learned more about me working for it. 
And I feel like if we're really going to make a change in the world, we have to think about what sh how she ended here, which is I learned more about me working for it and that it can be a variety of different things. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Allison, and thank you for having me today. Thank you, Joe. Um, as, I, as we had discussed before, um, educational theater students helped to facilitate a simulated telehealth environment through their real-time script performances that allowed occupational therapy framework uh, fieldwork students to interact with them dynamically and authentically. And that was really important for us. Um, as Lisa and Joe had mentioned, we had to think really creatively during the pandemic because um, students were displaced from their traditional clinical placements. And with the added um, benefit of having programs such as educational theater, we creatively created this uh, interprofessional collaboration. And it's very rare that occupational therapists would work with the educational theater students or educational theater performers in the day-to-day -day, um, practice settings. So this was a unique opportunity for both co cohorts to better appreciate one another. And it was really important for us to make sure that this was a mutually beneficial situation. OT, occupational therapy students, OT fieldwork students, uh, received 360 feedback about their clinical performances, which would not occur in a traditional fieldwork experience. So this is where we expanded the model. Um, once we send students into the field, we really don't have a sense of their day-to-day -day and what happens. So because this was simulated through the use of Zoom, um, we simulated telehealth best practices through that platform. And in doing so, we were able to record the didactic between the educational theater student who carried out these scenarios with the occupational therapy students. And it was really important. Uh, the students gained a better sense of themselves and um, were able to improve their clinical performance, um, which wouldn't be the case because it's usually a limited uh, memory recall of how you performed and what happened. Uh, students could then share this recording with their clinical instructors as well as their peers so they could, and the actors um, so that everyone can get and benefit from this uh, uh, didactic that took place and get that 360 feedback. Actors were also encouraged uh, to provide feedback to students, as I mentioned before, because um, usually in the clinic setting, you know, patients sometimes will be vocal and tell you how they feel. Um, but in this case scenario, we were able to debrief after those situations and actors could give that feedback both to the clinical instructors and to the students, which was really, uh, really, really a, a asset to this whole experience. Um, so some takeaways from this experience, I would say, is that students gained uh, an increased self-confidence in their clinical reasoning, therapeutic presence, communication skills, and clinical documentation skills, because um, we worked with clinical instructors through these settings, so we were able to kind of add those um, tried and true methods embedded into these didactics. Um, we also advocated and established a telehealth fieldwork simulation in our program and made it an OT permanent curriculum change, which is something that would not have been a thought um, pre-pandemic. So that's something that is a new takeaway for our program, since we know that a lot of the medical model and for our profession is uh, moving towards being able to deliver health care through these telehealth uh, environments. Also, it was really important for us that um, both sets of cohorts were informed about one another and what they bring to the table. So Joe and I worked uh, carefully to make sure that every party was oriented um, about expectations and um, best practices about how to interact during these sessions. Um, as you and I both know, um, life happens. So it was really important for us to add flexibility um, to this simulation model because, you know, in the event that an actor couldn't have come um, or if there was a connectivity issue with the internet, um, we were want wanted to make sure that we had flexibility in facilitating um, environments in the events that those situations occurred. Um, and with that, I want to show you a great clip um, about a session that took place. Um, with three occupational therapy students who are meeting with an educational theater student who is performing as James, who is an 18, a 16-year-old client experiencing autism and intellectual delay, as well as dysgraphia. Uh, the therapists in this session are addressing improving his social skills, 
as well as his bilateral coordination skills, as well as sensory processing through a guided reading, breathing activity. You loved that last week. We all did. So we'll all do it with you. So we put our hand up and we're going to start at the bottom of our thumb and we're going to breathe in while we go up our thumb and breathe out when we go down. That was awesome. So if you're ever feeling, if you're ever feeling in the, in the yellow or the red, the, the frustrated or the mean zone, the yellow or red, you can use that exercise at school or at home. You can do that. Great job. So uh, Daniel and Izzy, do you have any? So this is a great example of how our students were able to mimic environments that were taking place in pediatric school-based settings with the actors. And again, this collaboration would not have been possible without Lisa and Joe. Um, and so we really thank the opportunity for Dr. Nisha inviting us to kind of talk about our wonderful collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, Joe, and Allison. And now it is my great pleasure finally to introduce Dr. Anat Lubetsky, an associate professor in the Department of Physical Therapy and director of the PhD in Rehabilitation Sciences. Over to you, Anat. Thank you, Nisha, and thank you so much for having me. It's great to hear about all the exciting work that other people in the school are doing. Um, next. So I'm going to take you to a little bit of a different place and in how uh, graphic design and art and technology come together to help people with balance problems. And I study sensory integration. Uh, let me give you a quick uh, introduction to my world. Uh, so we use different sensors all the time when we balance ourselves, when we stand, when we walk, when we move. Um, there is visual information, there's information from the ground, there's what we hear. And so we kind of take everything in and find the right motor plan to make, to keep ourselves stable and how the individuals are able to kind of shift. We call it weight and reweight, use sensor information based on availability. For example, if you all stood up and closed your eyes, maybe you'll move a little more, but you're not gonna fall because you're gonna be able to use the information from the ground to stabilize yourself. But if people are unable to do that, for various reasons as we will discuss, that might increase the risk of fall. Next. <clears throat> and so the patients that I work with have uh, problems in their inner ear, what we call vestibular dysfunction for, uh, for various reasons. And so these patients get anxious, they get dizzy and off balance in environments that are noisy, busy, or visually complex. As we all remember New York from, you know, before March, 2020, as and it's starting to be now again. And we think that it's related to inefficient sensor integration. So this lack of ability to switch between systems. Next. At NYU, we formed this uh, amazing, I'm biased, I know, but amazing collaboration with people from the techno technological world, the clinical world, and, and researchers like me, who try to use technology to bring this, you know, sensor independence into the clinic. And so one of the first things we did is we used um, head-mounted displays, so virtual reality headsets that are portable, and try to make visual dependence a little more meaningful. So in the clinic, we often look at visual dependence as, like I said before, stand and close your eyes, um, or kind of create a car that has distracting background. But in uh, VR, you can create a lot of different environments. So this specific environment has been used in the literature for a long time, these moving stars of different frequencies and amplitudes. And when I just started working with Professor Perlin at Courant and his students and asked to build this into a, a VR, uh, the students I worked with I sent him the material and then he came to the meeting and said, the scene you asked me to program, I did on the subway on the way. Is there anything else that you wanna work on today? <laughs> and that really made me think there's so much more that we can do with technology, which we call beyond eyes closed. Next. Thank 
thank you. And so, for example, we started thinking really about the role of context. Can we look at different contexts of a busy street versus a busy subway, as opposed to just abstract stars? Does that matter in people's behavior and people balance? So with that, we were able to bring those different life contexts into the lab to incorporate other aspects that influence balance, such as, for example, we know that if a patient had fallen in a certain environment or became dizzy in a certain environment, they are more likely to feel uncomfortable in that environment again. And that's something that's very difficult to replicate in a laboratory or clinical setting if you don't have that technology. So this is just a small example where we tested a few patients with vestibular loss, a few patients with hearing loss and healthy controls. And indeed, we saw that the differences between groups, especially those with vestibular loss versus controls, was larger in this busy city scene as, as one example, as opposed to the, the abstract stars that I showed you before. And, and we're of course trying to understand why. Um, next. Um, one of the things that excites us about using VR is measurement. So, um, you know, a lot of what we know about balance is derived by the technology we have to measure it. Using head mounted display, we get a lot of information that we can actually measure outside of the lab. So I don't need fancy large laboratory with a lot of cameras and markers and kind of a, comp a complex setup. And actually we've all been talking, you know, about how the pandemic forced us to be creative and think outside the box. One of the first thing that I did when uh, the pandemic hit and our research was shut down, but the clinic was still functioning, the clinic I'm working with at Mount Sinai, is we transferred our entire paradigm into the clinic and started testing patients in the clinic because the clinic was working while the research lab was shut down. So this is an example where my research assistant is uh, kind of demonstrating the setup where we can measure people's balance from their waist and from their head just using the VR headset. This specific scene is we're looking at dynamic balance and how people respond to a ball coming at them. Um, and we saw some interesting differences in, in the way people carry their head in response to the ball between patients, <coughs> excuse me, and controls. Next. New technology also allows us, so so far I showed kind of standing and a little bit moving, but recently there is an untethered version of this head mounted display, meaning it's, it doesn't have a cable. So we can actually walk the whole room. And so I have a recently graduated uh, PhD student in computer science who's now I'm lucky to have him as a postdoc uh, at NYU who's working on a, a walking paradigm for patients to kind of cross obstacles with different um, visual load, auditory load, cognitive load while we're measuring their success rate and the way they kind of navigate the obstacles all in a completely portable system. So he worked a lot on, on the design of these obstacles, what they should look like, what the environment should look like and so on. Next. I'm kind of giving you a lot of snapshots into different studies that, that we're running because I know we're short on time. My main research question is actually about what we hear. Um, and the question of does what we hear matter for balance is now becoming more and more important because we see that people with hearing loss are at an increased risk for falls. And so we're using virtual reality to try to understand why. And I'm very proud of my partnership with music technology at Steinhardt because this amazing group of music technologies created different sounds for us. Some are synthetic lab made and some are real recorded sound from New York City that allow us to look at you know, the different roles of sounds in different environments and different contexts. Next. Lastly, I wanna give you a kind of a snapshot in how we're using VR for intervention. So I mentioned a few different questions that we're trying to understand using VR in terms of assessment of balance, such as visual dependence, the role of context as what we hear matter for balance, differences between patients with hearing loss and vestibular loss and controls. But um, when we started doing these assessment studies, a few patients came back and started they, and, and said they were feeling better. Even just after one session, of assessment. So that really made us come together as a group and say, can we use this for rehabilitation? And the truth is virtual reality has been used for rehabilitation for many years. We certainly did not invent the concept. Just think new technology really allows us to, you know, increase our outreach and have a broader impact so we can go outside the clinic. The idea is that using VR, we can reduce visual sensitivity through systematic manipulation of the environment. So we, we have, I'll show you some gradual levels of difficulty. And so if there are environments where, as I mentioned, people may feel uncomfortable, 
so they either get anxious or dizzy or avoid the environments altogether, we can kind of recreate this setting in a safe environment next to a physical therapist where the patient can leave the environment at any time. And the hope is that over time we can break that cycle because patients will feel more comfortable, they will move more, they will participate more, etc. Next. And so these are some sentences, quotes from patients that we've seen in, at the early stages of this. So after the last session, I felt less overwhelmed in the street. Uh, I get dizzy if I move like that, but in the park, I showed you the park scene, I felt fine. Patients who said this could be great therapy for me for making me move my head. So kind of the, we had lots of kind of anecdotal positive experience at first. Next. And so this is our user interface. We have different environments. I mentioned the, the, the role of context. So we have uh, the subway, which is this closed space. And I think everyone in New York City kind of experienced how, what a powerful sensory experience being in the subway is, right? Versus the airport, which is this large space where everything far away, we spend a lot of time on floors, different flooring makes people feel uncomfortable. So we took pictures of a lot of floors in the city and kind of created them into the environment. We have, of course, the street and then the, the dynamic park scene and the clinicians can control a lot of different parameters. So you could start in a completely empty environment if a patient is very anxious or symptomatic, just to establish control. And then gradually you can increase the amount of people, the speed of people, the color of the cars, or a lot of different variation. Next. Huh, it's not moving. <laughs> okay. Um, so this was a gift where they were supposed to move uh, and you could see uh, a low visual stimulus and high visual stimulus, but we can, you know, um, it's an art day, so we can pretend that we, um, you know, give, give it meaning, right? So uh, we can, uh, this is just an example for quantifying the visual load. Next. So um, this scene specifically we, is, is so functional. If you've ever been to, I know the sixth, uh, the sixth uh, stop on, on Bleecker Street has this very narrow pathway between the stairs and the train. And uh, to me, it's always scary. So let alone people who have um, sensory conditions. So we use this, this kind of narrow uh, pathway where patients can stand and look for the train and, and walk a little bit and kind of try to get more comfortable. Since we're talking about graphic design and art, I thought I, I wanted to kind of briefly discuss the point of um, how we went about designing this. And if you saw in the, the little snapshots that we did, our people are not real, you know, they, they look very much like avatar, the scenes, even though they provide the context, they are not necessarily an exact replica um, of, you know, people with bags or clothes or, um, and so we have had a lot of discussions about this and it's still an ongoing conversation. Um, my partner, Professor Pelling at the beginning felt very strongly that we should not go what you call hyperbit, but rather more generic. Uh, and there's some research in computer science that shows that if you try to go hyper real and really be super precise, that may actually at some point be a distraction to the user because one error in the whole experience falls apart. Whereas when we go semi-real and a little more abstract, you get the, the participant gets to put a lot more interpretation into their experience. So they make it their own. And so the other thing is I mentioned, you know, we, we want to make this accessible. We want to make it cheap. We want to make it such that it is in every clinic and later in the home. If we went for really hyper real uh, scenes, we would need super powerful computers very expensive headsets, very expensive design. And then I feel like we're not fulfilling the mission of using art and technology to reach to more and more people that wouldn't have it otherwise. Um, and so th that's why we chose to go about it. And, and, and we're still looking at, you know, the effect of different contexts, but, but that's our experience. And so we could use it with a laptop, you know, at any clinic, just like I showed you, we do the research outside of the clinic. Next. So finally, I, I uh, really want to thank my amazing interdisciplinary team. I, I mentioned it's a lot of people are involved here. So we have the technological team from NYU, from Courant, as well as Steinhardt um, um, Music Technology Applied Statistics. And I have an amazing clinical team at the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary of Mount Sinai, physicians and physical therapists. Um, and we all work together to make it happen. 
text. Um, I, by the way, am not affiliated with any virtual reality headset. I kind of didn't even say any name. We, we move with technology. It's, it's an interesting movement because technology moves pretty fast. We move with technology. We use the technology that best fits our questions and are needed at that time. We have been funded by, by other foundations and, and, and the NIH, but we, we want to make sure that our research has no uh, conflict of interest. Thanks. And, um, I'm gonna... Thank you so much, Anat. And can, Chloe, can I ask you to pin the rest of our speakers? And uh, I know that we are just, you know, closing in on the end of time. And I, I want to invite anybody who's watching to share your questions and your comments. And we'll invite any of our speakers to respond to them in the minutes that we have here. And uh, I, I will just, I just want to say thank you so much. You can see the wide range uh, of opportunities we have here to explore the intersections between the arts, including technology and health in the broadest definition. And so I want to thank each and every one of you for coming together today to share your profound work. And I look forward to many more opportunities like this as we continue to investigate what's possible here.